Welcome back to Good Distinctions. I'm your host, Will Wright, and Good Distinctions are the spice of life. So today, in anticipation of Labor Day, we're going to be looking at what the church says about the dignity of work, specifically dialing in on Pope Leo XIII's late 1800s encyclical, Rerum Novarum. It's a beautiful document. I hope everybody takes a chance to read it. Um, but I'm going to be going through a little bit of it today just to give a flavor. Uh, talking about the dignity of the human person and especially work, how the state interacts with that, how family needs to be a focal point, uh, and those sorts of things. So without further ado, let's dive into it. And I want to begin with this concept of the long 19th century. And this really began in 1789 with the French Revolution and ended with World War I. This phrase was coined by the British historian Eric Hogsbaum to describe a series of events that made speaking of 1789 to 1914 make more sense, more sense historically than speaking of 1800 to 1900, how we normally think of centuries. And he's categorized this long 19th century into three connected but distinct eras. The Age of Revolution was from 1789 to 1848. The Age of Capital was from 1848 to 1875, and the Age of Empire from 1875 to 1914. And historically, I think this is helpful. Now, Hogsbaum was a committed communist throughout most of his life, and so he sees history in terms of the Marxist lens of power struggles. In the midst of this time period, there were certainly struggles. The Enlightenment ideals came to a head with the French Revolution's cries of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The absolute monarchies and conservatism were beginning to be challenged, and the revolution was willing to use violence, if necessary, to change the dynamic of power and secure liberal values for the common man. Now, at the time, there were three classes in society known as estates. The first estate was the clergy. The second estate was the nobility, which you had to be born into. And the third estate were the commoners, everyone else. And of course, the king enjoyed absolute power over the whole polity. Once this hierarchical structure was deposed and democracy was awoken, the revolutionary spirit spread throughout Europe. So by 1848, only Russia and Britain remained largely untouched in terms of the monarchy. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing by the middle of the long 19th century. Factories were rising up throughout the United States and Europe, and these factories often had pretty horrific conditions, but they led to the concentration of wealth among the owners and operators of private enterprises. The tycoons of various enterprises became obscenely wealthy, but with the overturning of the feudal system, the common man was finding it difficult and off, oftentimes to earn a decent wage. The conditions in factories and mills led to sometimes men in their mid-30s retiring because they were physically no longer capable of work. Child labor was common. The work week consisted of six days, and the work day was sometimes 16 hours long. In some factories, tired workers uh, by accident would endure burns, cuts, scrapes, lost fingers, hair getting caught in the machinery, or even death. Admittedly, the imperial system at the time exported European culture and organizational structures and, and strategies to locales throughout the world. However, the sub subjection to hard labor, low pay, and widespread corruption, uh, not everywhere but many places, made it hard for the locals to see organization, or rather colonization, as a good thing. Especially in Africa, the lines drawn on the maps by the Europeans uh, were fairly arbitrary, and they created conflict between various tribes who up until that point were often at relative peace with one another. The long 19th century undoubtedly led to the world in which we now find ourselves in a lot of ways, and the progress of man in terms of technology, communication, and global interconnection was ep epoch-defining. However, as we can see from the 20th century, the abandoning of conservatism, traditional morality, solidarity among people, and Nietzsche's uh, death of God uh, led to death, genocide, destruction, 
and refusal to recognize the dignity of the human person on a, a scale that the world had never seen. The same communism that rose to prominence in the long 19th century and promised utopia ultimately was the direct cause of the negative effects in human death and destruction in the 20th century that we saw far too often. In the 19th century, communism was on the rise, social change was rapidly reordering Europe, industrialization was in full swing, and capitalism was becoming the dominant economic system. The working man was mistreated, sometimes egregiously, in many places, and communism became more and more appealing. It also should not be forgotten that aristocracy stood to gain the most from the new capitalist systems. Workers were unambiguously exploited and impoverished so often. And it's in this context, in 1891, that Pope Leo XIII wrote and released Rerum Novarum on capital and labor. This encyclical letter is the first of his social encyclicals and begins the development of what is now called Catholic Social Teaching, or CST. CST is nothing other than an application of perennial church teaching to the modern developments of capitalism, liberalism, socialism, materialism, and all the other isms. So CST is not new, but the world's ideologies and systems are in a lot of ways. So how does the church speak truth to the world and ensure that people are being approached with true dignity? Well, this is what CST aims to do. It's not a social justice warrior ideology. It's not an endorsement of capitalism or of communism, for that matter. The three major themes of Rerum Novarum are, one, the balancing of labor and capital, two, the common good, and three, the role of the state. Pope Leo XIII also recognized the special status of the poor and social issues, and especially God's love, compassion, and favor for the poor. This would later be called the preferential option for the poor. Pope Leo XIII says early on in the document that, quote, it is no easy matter to define the relative rights and mutual duties of the rich and of the poor, of capital and of labor. And the danger lies in this, that crafty agitators are intent on making use of these differences of opinion to pervert men's judgments and to stir up the people to revolt. So in this, the Pope is acknowledging why the workers are upset. They're being mistreated. He doesn't deny the good that the capitalist system can bring, but throughout Rerum Navarum, he offers a helpful and important critique of capitalism. He's likewise wary of liberalism and socialism. Without denying the reality of the world around him, the Pope is able to offer a balanced take on the situation. And this is why Rerum Navarum continues to be so important throughout the ensuing 132 years since it was written. The good distinctions the Pope is making are timeless, and even late 19th century distinctions, good distinctions, are the spice of life. Now, speaking of these rights and duties and offering a critique of the Marxist view of class struggle, the Pope says this, The great mistake made in regard to the matter now under consideration is to take up with the notion that class is naturally hostile to class that the wealthy and working men are intended by nature to live in mutual conflict. So irrational and so false is this view that the direct contrary is the truth. He goes on to say, just as the symmetry of the human frame is the result of the suitable arrangement of the different parts of the body, so in a state is it ordained by nature that these two classes should dwell in harmony and agreement so as to maintain the balance of the body politic. Each needs the other. Capital cannot do without labor, nor labor without capital. Mutual agreement results in the beauty of good order, while perpetual conflict necessarily produces confusion and savage barbarity. Now, in preventing such strife as this, and in uprooting it, the Pope goes on to say, the efficacy of Christian institutions is marvelous and manifold. First of all, there is no intermediary more powerful than religion, whereof the church is the interpreter and guardian. In drawing the rich and the working class together, by reminding each of its duties to the other, and especially of the obligations of justice. End quote. So workers have duties towards their employers, the Pope says. They're to perform their work conscientiously, which they've freely agreed to undertake, and they should not settle issues with violence, nor should they damage the property of their employer. 
Further, they are, quote, to have nothing to do with men of evil principles who work upon the people with artful promises of great results and excite, excite foolish hopes, which usually end in useless regrets and grievous loss, end quote. On the other hand, employers have duties as well. They should respect the digni dignity of their workers. There's a contract between employer and worker. They're not indentured servants, nor should they be seen as a factor in production. The employer needs to remember that working for a living is an honorable thing. They're not to overtax their workers by giving them work that's beyond their physical or mental capability. And employers must not defraud their employees into reducing their wages or creating undue pressure. The Pope says to defraud anyone of wages that are his due is a great crime, which cries to the avenging anger of heaven. It's a strong quote. One of the most important items that Pope Leo writes about is the idea of what we now call a living wage. He says, let the working man and the employer make free agreements, and in particular, let them agree freely as to the wages. Nevertheless, there underlies a dictate of natural justice more imperious and ancient than any bargain between man and man. Namely, that wages ought not to be insufficient to support a frugal and well-behaved wage earner. If through necessity of fear of a worse evil, the workman accept harder conditions because an employer or contractor will afford him no better, he is made the victim of force and injustice, end quote. So these free agreements duly honor the dignity of man and also lead to the flourishing of the worker, the employer, and the state. So the Pope says that the state should ensure that the interests of the working class are, as he says, carefully watched over because it will be a benefit to the whole community that, quote, being housed, clothed, and bodily fit, they may find their life less hard and more endurable. So now let's briefly examine the second main theme, the common good. In a critique of socialism, the Pope says that people have a right to private ownership. However, this right has to be balanced against the notion of the common good. As he says, the chief and most excellent rule for the right use of money is one the heathen philosophers hinted at, but which the church has traced out clearly and is not only made known to men's mind, but is impressed upon them their lives. Uh, impressed upon their lives. It rests on the principle that is, it is one thing to have the right to the possession of money and another to have the right to use money as one wills. Private ownership, as we have seen, the Pope says, is the natural right of man. And to exercise that right, especially as members of society, is not only lawful, but absolutely necessary. He goes on to say, though, that whoever has received from the divine bounty a large share of temporal blessings, whether they be external and material or gifts of the mind, has received them for the purpose of using them for the perfecting of his own nature. And at the same time that he may employ them as the steward of God's providence for the benefit of others. So there's nothing wrong with having material wealth, but these gifts need to be used well and properly ordered to the good of all in common. The Pope makes this point explicitly when he says all citizens without exception can and ought to contribute to that common good in which individuals share so advantageously to themselves. End quote. So there must, of course, be a special concern in weighing the good of all society towards the poor and marginalized precisely because they are powerless in many concerns to advocate for themselves. And the, th the role of the state is the third main theme in Rerum Navarum, and it's fairly simple. The state exists to ensure the well-being of all in society, that the common good is served, and the state must support individuals and families to grow and develop. The Pope writes this. He says, Hereby then it lies in the power of a ruler to benefit every class in the state, and among the rest to promote the utmost the interests of the poor. And this, in virtue of his office and without being open to suspicion of undue interference, since it is the province of the commonwealth to serve the common good. And the more that is done for the benefit of the working classes by the general laws of the country, the less need will there be to seek for special means to relieve them, end quote. So besides ensuring the dignity of the human person, this advice is really practical. 
If workers are benefited from the outset, then the needs of special programs will be lessened and perhaps eliminated. Can you imagine, for example, a society which takes the needs of the lower and middle classes seriously in a preemptive sense, rather than pouring money into social welfare programs that address needs after the fact? What would need to change in a society for this to become a reality? It's something which I think future and current generations need to contend with. And frankly, the Catholic Church is the only institution which can lead the way, as it always has. The balance needed, especially in our broad and globalized society, comes from the life-giving, saving gospel of Jesus Christ, instantiated through the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity. The state should not subsume the place of individuals and families. It should be at the service of them and no more. As the Pope says, quote, we have said that the state must not absorb the individual or the family. Both should be allowed free and untrammeled action so far as is consistent with the common good and the interest of others. Human beings have dignity and worth, and the human family is the fundamental cell of society. If the state overwhelms this reality, then society falls apart. If you're interested in learning more of a and more of an analysis on this, please go listen to a, a past episode entitled Solidarity and Subsidiarity. So in Rerum Navarum, the Pope teaches clearly that an, an important key to human dignity is the availability of fulfilling work with pay and working conditions that show care and concern for the needs of the worker. Further, families have tangible needs and communities need to benefit from private enterprise. I've not even really scratched the surface of the masterpiece that is Rerum Novarum by Pope Leo XIII. I highly recommend giving the whole thing a read through, especially if you are yourself engaged in private enterprise, government work, or are a worker or employer. So really what I'm saying is that everyone should read this document. If you'd like to walk through the seven main themes of Catholic social teaching, please go listen to a previous episode entitled, Does Jesus Want Us to Be Social Justice Warriors? Admittedly, the title is a little clickbaity, um, but I basically just explain the broad movements of Catholic social teaching. So I hope today's episode has been worthwhile to you. Uh, if you haven't yet subscribed on Substack at gooddistinctions.com, please consider doing so. That way you'll never miss on a, a thing that we put out. And we're grateful to have you with us in the Good Distinctions community. As always, if you have any questions, comments, episode ideas, or want to chat, please reply uh, here on whatever platform you're listening or send us an email at gooddistinctions at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And please, if you did enjoy this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, uh, wherever you're listening to this and, and subscribe while you're there. And please uh, especially share this on YouTube, uh, from YouTube rather. Uh, it can really help us grow the platform. And uh, if you're on Instagram, follow us at Good Distinctions. So again, I'm Will Wright. I've been your host today talking about Rerum Novarum by Pope Leo XIII in anticipation of Labor Day coming up. So when Labor Day rolls around, think about the dignity of the human person and the dignity of work and uh, be grateful to God for the gift of, of labor and prayer. Uh, so I hope you've had a, a, a good time listening to this and we'll see you next week on Good Distinctions because good distinctions are the spice of life. Take care.